NBPGR, NBPGR, and Secretary NAS, New Delhi. Our statutory officers of RLBCAU, uh, Director Research, uh, uh, Director Extension Education, sir, Director uh, Education, sir, uh, who, Dean Agriculture, sir, Dean Horticulture and Forestry, sir, head of the departments and all the faculties and your students. And uh, I also especially would like to take this opportunity to welcome uh, all the guests from all over the country. So members or scientists who have joined us for this event from all over the other institutes uh, other than our RLBCAU. Uh, I like to then who has everyone has come to attend this today's uh, lecture, which is under the umbrella of undergoing Atal J Vikyan lecture series. So this Atal J Vikyan lecture series is a, a university initiative. Uh, to offer our heartfelt tribute to the legendary politician Sri Atal Bihari Bajpayee ji, a former prime minister of the country. So today's lecture, it is the 16th lecture under this series, uh, and it will be delivered by our esteemed guest, Dr. Casey Bansalsa, former director, NBPGR, Secretary NAS, New Delhi, on the topic, genes, genomics, and germplasm for climate resilience and nutritional security. So starting our scheduled program, I would like to request Director of Education, Sir Dr. Anil Kumar Sir, uh, to give the uh, welcome address and also give some uh, information about the Atal J. Vigyan Lecture Series and also about some developmental processes in our uh, university. So, Thank you, Dr. B. G. Lakshmi, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Sir Professor Arvind Kumar, our most distinguished speaker of the day, Professor Kailash Bansal, former director, Indian Council of Agriculture Research, National Bureau of Plant, National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resource, and Secretary NAS, New Delhi. Our colleague from the Neighboring Institution, Director IGFRI, Dr. Andres Chandra, Director Kafri, Dr. E. Arunachalam, our colleague, Dr. A. R. Sarma, Director Research, Dr. S. S. Singh, Director Extension Education, Dr. S. K. Chaturvedi, Dean Agriculture, Dr. E.K. Pandey, Dean Horticulture and Forestry, faculty member, scientist of RLB CU, teaching associate, non-teaching staff and employee. A very good afternoon and very warm welcome to all of you in the land of Bundelkhand, the heart of India, known for the 1857 freedom movement led by great warrior, the queen of Jhansi, Rani Lakshmi and land of legendary hockey player, Major Dhyan Chan, whose great services towards this nation have been recognized by the government of India by naming Major Dhyan Chan Khel Ratan Award this year onward. This is the highest sporting honor of the Republic of India. So, Jhansi or Bundil Khan feel really delighted to have such legendary figures in our this land of Bundil Khan. Our newly developing Rani Lakshmi Vai Central Agriculture University was recently inaugurated and dedicated to the nation by our Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi ji, on August 29, 2020. Within a short span of seven years, this university has developed remarkably. We are striving to grow with the same spread of dedication and commitment. The university also conferred Best University Infrastructure Award at the national level. And this year, we all are celebrating 75 year of Independence Day as Ajadi Kamrat Mahotsav. On the eve of Independence Day, we are organizing first lecture in the year 2021-22, but it is the 16th lecture under Atal Javigyan lecture series. Today we have with us a very distinguished scientist of par excellence, former director of ICR and BPGR New Delhi, and Fellow of National Academy of Agricultural Sciences and currently Secret Secretary, National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, who has conceptualized and proven the value of vast potential of germplasm by searching and hidden, searching, hidden and creating value through modern genomics and bioinformatics approaches while he was the director of NBPGR. He is the great motivator and orator and 
in I in person also trained under his tutelage and worked in one of the collaborative project to engineer Brassica for alternative light resistance by integration of two important genes, namely osmotin and anexin, which are modulating the complex signal transduction pathway of the program cell death and cell proliferation map kinase machinery. Sir, it is our wish that uh, your, your scintillating lecture should be organized physically in our university, but we could not do so and invited you to interact with our stakeholder through this digital platform during 16th Atal Javigyan lecture due to coronavirus pandemic. It's my privilege to welcome again on 16th lecture under Atal Javigyan lecture series initiated by the far-sighted vision and inspiration of our honorable vice chancellor the initiation of Hotel J. Vigyan lecture series in 2018 by our university is to pay homage to our Prime Minister, Sri Atal Vihari Bajpayee who passed away on August 16, 2018 after his long illness. Honorable Sri Bajpayee has floated the slogan J. Vigyan along with J. Jawan, J. Kisan, realizing the potential of science and technology in every walk of life and also socio-economic development of the nation. In order to cherish his memories and vision towards scientific development, this series is a milestone from, for our university and it also provides a platform for sharing the wide experiences, wisdom and noble thought of the distinguished scientists and dignitaries having diverse contribution in the development of science and technology in this country. In this manner, we are also remember uh, the contribution of our popular leader for building the nation and give our heartfelt tribute to great visionary of the country. To broaden our knowledge under this Atal Jaya Vigyan Vyakhyan Mala, expert of various scientific fields discuss more about current and emerging trends of science and related application. Several lectures under this series are on different topics why national dignitaries awarded with Padam Bhushan, Padam Sri and other coveted award of national and international importance. And this lecture series also befitting the broad goal of our university vision and vision of our honorable vice chancellor to attain academic excellence and bridging the distances between the academic institution of national and global arena to develop RLBCU as agriculture hub of eminence in this region. Today's lecture will be delivered by Professor Kalash Chand Bansal, his tremendous contribution and expertise in agriculture, biotechnology, plant genetic engineering, or abiotic stresses, development designation of valuable germplasm across the India, and possessing scientific leadership credential with more than 150 research publications, process technology, and many more are in his continuing scientific journey. journey. He is an able researcher who has proven his worth at national and international arena due to his sound leadership and inventiveness. And I feel very happy that you have given your concurrence to deliver your scientific thought in this important series. On my personal behalf and also on behalf of our university, I extend my sincere thanks to our key speaker of the day, Dr. Vansal, a real innovator and round scientist has proven why his significant contribution in the field of science and technology. We all feel honored by your gracious presence in the Atal Javigyan lecture series. And indeed, it's a great pride to our university for initiating this lecture series in the name of visionary leader. Thank you for your patience hearing. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the welcome address. And you have also ignited a fire of importance about the Atal J. Vigyan lecture series. And you have reminded us that we should uh, go for, we should move forward. Then after hearing the, the words from, or the biodata from you, sir, about our esteemed speaker, Dr. Kailash Chan Pansar, sir, we are very much delighted to hear from you now, sir. So directly, uh, I would like to invite our esteemed speaker uh, to give the presentation on the topic, genes, genomics, and germplasm for climate resilience and nutritional security. So uh, the screen is yours, sir, please. So uh, you have to allow me to share the screen first, please. I'm not allowed to share the screen. Dr. Tanus Mishra, sir, you can. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. 
And also you have to bear with me some background music. There is some program they just started in our lawn. I'm sorry about it. I will try to get it. Please introduce Dr. Bansal, please. Uh, okay, okay, sir. For uh, sir, sir, before uh, giving your presentation, I officially would like to invite Dr. Shubha Trivedi, our co coordinator of the Atal Devi Gyan Lecture Series, to just give a brief introduction about our uh, speaker, sir. Okay, thank you, Vijay Lakshmi. Uh, a very good evening to all. It's an honor and privilege for me to introduce today's esteemed speaker, Dr. K.C. Bansal, sir. Welcome, sir. Professor Bansal is an eminent scientist and known plant biotechnologist of India. Presently, he is serving as Senior Advisor, Alliance of Biodiversity International, Asia India, Member, Board of Directors, Global Plant Council, and Secretary, National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, New Delhi. Dr. Bansal obtained his PhD degree with gold medal from Indian Agricultural Research Institute in 1988 and completed his postdoctoral research in plant molecular biology at Harvard University, Cambridge, USA. He started his career as scientist S1 and served as director ICR NDPGR, New Delhi, before uh, health. Before joining as director, Dr. Bansal was professor of molecular biology and biotechnology at National Research Center on Plant Biotechnology, IERI, New Delhi. Professor Bansal has also uh, supervised over 20 doctoral students and imparting training to over 500 scientists and scholars at national and international level. He has published over 150 research papers in, uh, artic and articles in journals of international repute, including Nature Biotechnology and Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, USA. He also has beheaded as coordinator of national project on transgenics in crops across various ICR institutes. He is a recipient of several national and international awards and honors. In the year 1990, he was awarded the Overseas Research Associated, uh, Associateship by the De De Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, to work at Harvard University and the prestigious Rockefeller Biotechnology Career Fellowship in 1996 to work at Rockers University, New Jersey, USA. He is the recipient of Professor Girala Chakravarti Award of Indian Science Congress Association by Honorable PM, Prime Minister of India. He has been honored with the Hari Krishna Shastri Award by ILI New Delhi and Rafi Ahmad Kibai Award by the ICR. Professor Bansal is a fellow of National Academy of Agricultural Sciences and National Academy of Sciences, India, and recipient of Recognition Award by the NASA. Recently, in January 2021, he got second highest award of National Academy of Agricultural Sciences by Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Government of India. We, the RLPCU fraternity, are extremely happy and feel honored to have you, sir, as a uh, today's guest speaker under Atal Levigan Lecture Series. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Now, I would request Dr. Bansal, sir, please start your presentation, sir. Can I now okay, share? Yes, sir, you can share. Thank you. No, it's not. Uh... Full view, cut the yes, sir. Yes, Full view. Yes, sir. yes, now it is visible, sir. Yes, sir. No, but I want to minimize this and I want to see whether it goes to the next slide or not. It does. Okay, um, well, good afternoon to all of you. Can you hear me well? Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Yes, sir. Um, at the outset, it's an honor to be invited by the Rani Jhansi's Rani Lakshmi Bai Central Agriculture University um, 
and the Vice Chancellor, I'm very thankful to him, Professor Arvind Kumar. And I'm delighted actually speaking, you know, quite a bit to see the presence of several other directors of the Jhansi based ICR institutes, faculty members of the university, the students and friends. It's an honor for me to be speaking to you today. And again, thanks to all the faculty members and students of the university and Professor Dr. Arun Kumar for, for inviting me and especially Dr. Anil Kumar, the Director of Education for taking lead in, in, you know, in inviting me for this particular lecture today. And the topic assigned to me is, as you can see, genes, genomics and germplasm for climate resilience and nutritional security. I don't have to actually speaking overemphasize the importance of climate resilience and nutrition security in this country, or for that matter, food security in this country. I'm not going to show you any of such introductory slides, you know, that our population has gone up, the temperatures are going up, there's a shrinking, you know, base of our natural resources like water and land, and also, you know, how much concern we have with regard to malnutrition in this country. This is all very well known. So as a scientist, I thought I'm talking to the faculty members and the students of an upcoming Central Agriculture University of India. And I would like to actually take this opportunity to, to congratulate Professor Dr. Arvind Kumar for taking this lead as an institution builder. I have seen him working so hard as Deputy Director General in ICR system, you know, for creating not only getting approval on paper, as you can all see now creating this institution, mega institution, as Dr. Anil Kumar said, the heart of India in Jhansi, the Rani Lakshmi Bai Central Agriculture University. So since I'm addressing this newly upcoming university students and faculty members, I thought I will just give them a kind of a glimpse rather than giving all the data of various problems and concerns we have, I'm sure, this agriculture university staff would all know it very well. I would start with straight away, actually speaking, searching from, for genes, that's what I'm going to cover, and starting with germplasm. I'm going to start with germplasm and go this way to genomics, to genes, and then come back to germplasm later. You know, and, and, and remembering today, you know, our honorable prime minister who's in whose name and honor you have started this you know, Atal Jay Vigyan lecture series. It's so very important. I'm so very happy that the university has taken this lead and already 15 lectures have been organized right from 2018. So I remember as well and pay my tributes and regards to this great of our country, the honorable late prime minister, Sri Atal Bihari Vashpeji, to add this Jay Vigyan to the already existing slogan given by Lal Bahadur Shastriji, another great son of the soil, you know, who gave the slogan of Jai Jawan Jai Kisan. And, and, and it's, it's an honor. And, and also, I would say, tribute to the scientists of this country to have added the word Jai Vigyan. And now, of course, our Honorable Prime Minister, currently, Mr. Modi, has added Jai Anusandhan to it as well. So the idea is when we talk of Jai Vigyan or Jai Anusandhan, the idea is to promote the use of science for the welfare of society on, at large. But for us as agricultural scientists, the important is welfare of farmers. So, and science alone will not be useful until unless we develop some new technologies. You know, these new technological advances are important ultimately for enhancing productivity and profitability of agriculture. I'm talking about both productivity and profitability. Off late, as you know, in India, we have got a slogan again of doubling our farmers' income. So not only the productivity is important for feeding the, the you know, burgoing population globally and also, of course, of India, but I think for the Indian farmers, who are mostly smallholder farmers, profitability is extremely important. So I'm very happy that the university has taken a lead to add value to this particular Jay Vigan slogan given by Honorable Atul Bihari Bajpayee and started this lecture series. And I'm sure the faculty members and students will further take the benefit of this lecture series and really speaking meaningfully will translate the actions of science into these new technological advances for the welfare of farmers. And I said before, I would start with germplasm. Actually, many of our agricultural scientists should know that when we talk of genes, 
But right in 1937, searching genes from germplasm resources for crop improvement, this paper came in in 1937 by the then, the only scientist who started, you know, this journey of genes in germplasm, Dr. B.P. Paul that time, you know, and, and fortunately I had a pleasure of meeting him in his few last years before his death. And he became a good friend to me, actually speaking. Such a great luminary he was. So he gave this message right in 1937 that these genes are important and where with these genes we can always get it, we can only get it from the germplasm resources. And he advocated a systematic conservation, evaluation, and characterization of this germplasm, we also call it a genetic variability or crop diversity. Also later in 1967, Norman Borlaug emphasized the role of germplasm resources in genetic variability. And in 1984, another leading scientist of the world, Otto Frankl, gave a concept of utilizing these germplasm resources by developing core sets, which is 10% of the entire collection, you know, of, of the germplasm which you have in that national gene mix. I will explain a little further as I, as I go further into my presentation. So friends, when we talk of this germplasm resources, you know, what is this important here is to again share with you, you know, that India is a biodiversity rich nation. You know, as you can see here, India is a biodiversity rich nation. We have got four hotspots in Himalayas, Northeastern India, Indo-Burma border, we call it, or Western Ghats or in Andaman Nicobar, out of about 35, 36 hotspots in the world, four of them, you know, where we got rich agrobiodiversity or biodiversity in general present in, in our country. And we're talking of crop diversity, crop genetic diversity is so important uh, among the total value of agrobiodiversity. And the point is why it matters. Crop genetic diversity matters in six areas, you know, and, and it is essential. The use of these crop diversity is essential for these six areas. One is adapting to climate change. We are suffering from climate change at the moment, as you all know, reducing environmental degradation, ensuring food security, protecting nutrition security, reducing poverty, and ensuring sustainable agriculture. And also, our faculty members and students must know that we have an international instrument called as Convention on Biological Diversity, which came into force in 1993. And India is a signatory to it. There are about 190 in our countries, members, or contracting parties, as we call them, of this international instrument, which is Convention on Biological Diversity, which is a legally binding international instrument. And it has the following objectives. And these are legally binding objectives when we are a partner or signatory or contracting party of this convention, in short, we call it CBD. And what are the objectives are conservation of biological diversity. We must conserve all biological diversity present in our own country. And it gives us a sovereign right on all biological diversity present in the geographical locations of our country, India. And we must try to put use to it and its different components in a sustainable way sustainable use of its components of various kinds of biological diversity. As you know, we have got different bureaus in our country, you know, for the insects, we have got for microbes, we have got for animals, we have got for plants, you know, and, and, and all. So we have, this is important for conservation and not only conservation, sustainable utilization of this biological diversity is very important. Third objective, I will not deal it with today, maybe somewhere I will touch upon it, but it's important for you to just remember that if, we use any such biological diversity for the improvement of crop products like commercial varieties. So whatever the benefit will come to that particular company or anybody, they will, then the farmers from where this original biological diversity originated will get that equitable sharing of the benefits arising out of the utilization of the genetic resources. But anyway, we can deal with that separately. I'm not going to talk much about this. I just wanted to tell you how important the germplasm or the biological diversity is in today's scenario. So when we talk of conservation, conservation of course is being done of all these plant genetic resources, the germplasm resources in, in international gene banks. You know, they're all called as gene banks because you know, the germplasm resources are really speaking the original sources of the genes. You know, without the genetic resources or biological resources, there's no way until unless you synthesize it, but of course you have to also understand, you know, the gene structure, function, et cetera, right from the genetic resources to various traits of economic importance. 
So the conservation is very important. Conservation has been done internationally in about 1,750 gene banks across the world. And these are the total number of accessions which have been conserved globally, 7.4 million accessions. And these are all different gene banks in actually brief shown here, mostly of these you know, CG centers. Like we have got ICRI in Philippines, we've got ICRISET, ICRISET in Hyderabad, we've got ICARDA, we have got IATA, we have got IPJURI, we have got you know, CIMIT in, in Mexico, we've got Peru, you've got the Central Inter, you know, International DILA PAPA, that is this International Potato Research Center. And so these are all different crop based international CG centers where the germplasm of various crops have been conserved. And that is available across the world for utilization, which is the second objective of the Convention of Biological Diversity. But apart from all these, about so many 1800 gene banks, there's one you can see here, you know, which is near the North Pole, that is called as Swalbard Global Seed Wall. That's only one. Because this is actually speaking not to lose this material. So the point message is here, see how important this material is that the world has created one international gene bank, they call it, near North Pole, where the germplasm from these different gene banks is also in duplicate, safety duplicates, as they call it, conserved here. You know, so that's very important. That is for posterity, forever, every, you know, for, for all, you know, years to come. And this is that global permafrost facility, we call it, the global, you know, Swalbert Seed Vault where I had an option to visit actually myself as a part of the delegation in, in 2014 to deposit our own material from India, a little bit of pitch and pea. Part of the delegation, Mr. Ashish Bhaugana, you know, Dr. Mandal from DRDO, Mr. Azus Bhaugana, the Secretary of Ministry of Agriculture and, my, and myself. And this is that, you know, gene bank, it's buried in the, in the, in the snow, actually, it's a tunnel, you know, and also India is trying to develop one of its own kind as well, somewhere discussions are on by, by the ICR. So, as, as I said, there are 1,750 gene banks globally. One of them happens to be in India. We call it Indian National Gene Bank, and that is, by the way, second largest gene bank in the world, where we conserve about a total of 4.5 lakhs accessions of different crops, as you can see here which are all very important for food and agriculture. We, we conserve them in the form of seeds in India, you know, in this gene bank, or we conserve them in in vitro bank in the form of tissue cultures or cryobank is, is also there. And this is actually speaking in a happening place where many of the international visitors speak, you know, all you can see here, Dr. Swaminathan, this is Mary Haga. You know, she was at one time the minister of Norway and also the executive director of the Global Crop Diversity Trust, you know, and Dr. Swapandatta and Dr. Mandal and, and Dr. Mathur, the in charge of the Biodiversity International at that time, our Honorable Minister, when he just joined in 2014, also, you know, appreciated the activity in the ICF system uh, of a gene bank. So the point is here, friends, that we have conservation of all these resources here, but now the next challenging task is, you know, this we have been conserving for the last about 40 to 50 years, you know, so, but conservation alone, is of course very important, but if you want to find value, you want to use them as sources of different genes, you know, then you must try to characterize them, understand them, evaluate them, and identify some lines which are tolerant or resistant to various diseases or to abiotic stresses, so as to know what kind of genes are present in which one of these accessions when we talk this large number. For example, given you know, in cereals, we have got about 100,000, one lakh accessions in rice alone, 25,000 accessions in wheat. So therefore it's important to narrow down this number to some of those agronomically useful identified donors, which can be then utilized for isolation of certain genes or for utilizing those donors directly in breeding or pre-breeding programs. So what therefore, and this was a challenging task, I must tell you, and I initiated it actually speaking. We, I would say, I mean, people say that we've made impossible possible. In the sense, I said before, I'm just giving an example of wheat here, we have about 22,000 accessions, or rather 25,000 accessions. We found some duplicates, we removed, and we left with 22,000. And when we started, we don't conserve a lot of material in our gene banks. We conserve only a few thousands of seeds. And that will not be enough to lay out a whole experiment, which I wanted to, for factorization and evaluation of the whole germplasm of wheat. And, but then we found 16,000 accessions are falling short. 
in terms of the number of seats available for carrying out a large experiment, which I had in mind that time in, in 2011, you know, 2011. So we went for a mega off-season multiplication trial, you can see here in Wellington, sometimes in May, you know, and, and this picture, we organized a field day in August of 2011. We harvested this material in 2011, or sorry, in, in October, and brought that material to, um, to NBPGR. To undertake, and this, in fact, this trial itself became an attraction for the media as well, and was covered by, in Hindu. So finally, we were able to lay out this thanks to then Dr. Coker, the vice chancellor, who gave me this permission to use the best piece of their land running into, you know, I think a number of, you know, hectares and acres and the best piece. So we were, we were able to put all 22,000 accessions in one go ever to characterize and evaluate this material. But then only we can then identify some of those out of 22,000 few lines which are important so that breeders can utilize it, molecular biologists can utilize it for isolating genes, etc. So I'm just giving you what all we were able to achieve. First of all, we were able to achieve and develop a core set. As I said before, in 1984, Otto Frankel gave a concept of core set. That means if you cannot use these 22,000 excesses, which is the large number, can we isolate 10% of it out of this whole set, about 2,000? So this 2,000 becomes a workable material for any you know, molecular beater or, 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 or a genetic scientist to really understand the basis of tolerance or resistance in many of those germplasm which we will be able to utilize later. So we developed this core and then we developed a composite core because wheat has got, you know, which we cultivate three different species, triticum mistyvum, triticum dicocum, and triticum durum. And we combined all those three species and we developed, we call it as a composite core. And, and this was of course recently published last year in November, 2020 in one of the prestigious journals, Crop Science. But before that, we also identified new sources of resistance to disease, particularly for rust and spot blocks. I'm not going to give you the, all the details, all this material about 22,000 extensions of wheat in different hotspots of particular diseases like rust, spot blotch, you know, in, in, in Gurdaspur, in, in um, Punjab or in Kuch Bihar, North Bengal or in Wellington, I said before for rust and all different spots and with all the pathologists working in wheat together, we, we carried out these trials and we identified these new, so new sources of resistance to rust and spot blotch. We also identified new sources of resistance to powdery mildew. You know, this, this paper again, you know, last year together with the core paper were published in crop science in 2020. All the papers, by the way, were recognized so nicely that they decided to put it on the cover of, of this crop science journal I'm talking about it, which was released on November 11, 2020 online. And they mentioned about the Indian National Gene Bank, you know, that this material conducted, you know, I mean, found useful for, for and, and this is the link given right on the cover of both the papers. So actually speaking, this is what I wanted to give a message to, to all the faculty members, students, when you're looking for, or as Dr. B.P. Paul said it right in the beginning in 1937, that searching the new genes, but where do you search them? You search them in these hidden germplasm collections we have in these national genes. So now, in case of wheat, you have material ready for searching your genes for resistance to, to spot blotch, for resistance to rust diseases, for resistance to powdery mildew, and not only that, we have also identified a reference set for searching genes for terminal heat stress tolerance in wheat by analyzing again those 20,000 lines for different temp for different parameters like canopy temperature, leaf vaccines, days to maturity, grain yield, thousand seed weight, which we all know are directly related, directly or di indirectly related with with heat tolerance in case of wheat. And these trials were visited by the global wheat director and many other scientists from SIMIT. And, and as you will see, and this was appreciated by they get, you know, as a item of success, and, and, and it was recognized by Lim Kabuki wheat like never before with regard to food security. And, and also, you know, he's an expert, internationally renowned, you know, Matthew Reynolds on heat tolerance in wheat. He specifically came only for two days to, to discuss with us and to look at this trial, you know, that how big this trial is ever possible, you know, to be conducted at a single location with um, entire germplasm you know, of, of wheat collected in Indian National Gene Bank. Also, Professor Deepak Pantel, many others 
they appreciated this work. And of course, when I informed them, when our, got, our papers got published, and this is a kind of message we got from Dr. Mahapatra, you know, and Dr. Deepak Pantel, Professor Sudhir Sopori, or Dr. A.K. Padi, who's an IES, but a country director in Nikraset, and our current good friend, Dr. Ashok Singh, the director of IRI. And finally, in fact, once Dr. Swaminathan happened to visit when I was there in 2013, and he went back, he had, of course, heard all this story which I told him, you know, when he was visiting us. But later, when he went to Chennai, he wrote with his email. So happy to visit NBPGR again. Converting NBPGR as a function conserved there must have a function. We must find value in, in, in it for various traits, which is important. Today, as we're talking of even climate resilience or nutrient security, or for increasing natural resources efficiency, you know, for water, for radiation, for land, you know, can we produce more from less for more as our honorable prime minister is talking about it. So until, unless we find value in this existing generic potential we have, you know, in, in our own germplasm and which we own it as a legal right on it, actually speaking through the convention of biological diversity, I think then only friends, you know, I just a message trying to give to the students it's so important to look into it. And, and, but then once you have identified that kind of material, the next challenge is today in 21st century, the potential bidding alone will not take us that far. It is important, no doubt about it. It's given green revolution. Today, we are proud having more than 300 million tons food production in our country, only as a result of conventional plant bidding. But then certain traits, as we have seen in Bt cotton, we've seen in Bt brinjal, we've seen you know, brassica hybrids through a GM root. There are certain traits or certain characteristics and features we would like to add into our existing you know, hybrid, in, into existing cultivated types that will only happen through emer emerging science-based technologies. You know, and these science-based technologies, of course, and, and why it is important as I've given a message here that we must accelerate the rate of genetic improvement of crops and that need to be coupled with increased use efficiency of shrinking natural resources. You know, what we have, our high yielding varieties, whether you talk of wheat or rice or any other crop for that matter, they require a lot of water, they require a lot of pesticide, a lot of agrochemicals. But idea is now using this emerging science technology. Can we do away with that kind of a concept? And with less resources, can we produce more? You know, so combined with conventional building, we must have these emerging science-based technology as well. So, in summary, if I tell you what we have done so far, for example, from Gene Bank, you know, we've taken these plant genetic resources, the idea to enhance the utilization of these plant genetic resources. I give an example of wheat will be characterized and evaluated morphologically, physiologically, agronomically for various traits. I give an example, and we could develop core set and trait specific reference set for different traits in case of wheat. That can be of course done and being done in many other crops as well. But this was the first exercise done in wheat with large, with all accessions we have. So after this, what is important is that we can use this material we have identified either through pre-beading or through beading or through association mapping, identify the, the QTLs, the markers, or the genes responsible for various traits, you know, which were hidden there otherwise in gene bank for, for a particular crop. And then you can use these approaches like molecular beading or genetic engineering or genome merit for agriculture. Finally, for developing not only high yielding genotypes as we are talking today, you know, which are more responsive to irrigation, to fertilizers, etc. We want combined with high yielding, with less resources, climate resilience as well, and of course, nutritionally enriched. So as we go down here, as you've shown in this arrow, here you have got conserved the germplasm, its value is minimal. But once you subject to all these kind of root as shown here, the PGR value will increase to a maximum level. And this is what we want to do using this basically the new developments of science and technologies. So friends, I gave a title to my presentation when Dr. Kumar called me and I gave it suddenly actually, you know, he didn't give me enough time to think I believe. The title I gave was genes, genomics and germplasm. But then I said, no, I think it is really speaking the other way around. It is germplasm to genomics to genes and then back to germplasm. So this is the real clockwise direction it must move. There's no other, there is no other way. 
Germplasm, I give an example, characterize it, evaluate it, use genomics tools, you know, identify markers, et cetera, or genes. And when you go to germplasm, once you identify a candidate gene, go and find its allele, better allele, a rare allele, which will be present in this germplasm. And then again, you use that information for crop improvement through molecular breeding, genomic breeding, genetic engineering, or genome editing. So I'm going to talk about mostly about genome editing, a little bit, of course, touch upon. I've got my own lifetime actually spent on genetic engineering. I'm not going to talk about all that work we did, but just give an example and then talk about a little bit to the students, particularly to the faculty members about the genome editing. But you must know, and I didn't talk to you much about it, but I'm sure this is being covered in the classroom lectures. If not, I would request Professor Arvind Kumar to must add it into this for the plant breeding students or for all plant science students is important to know about as a little bit mentioned and connected the presentation of germplasm with conventional biological diversity, Nagoya protocol with regard to benefit sharing, digital sequence information is very important when we talk of the genes, digital sequence information, and we, this is international treaty on plant genetic resources, for food and agriculture. So these are basically some international instruments, you know, and also we have got as a result of that in our country, I have not shown here like National Biodiversity Act, you know, so that is an outcome of this, you know, or of course, that's another point. We, I'm not talking about it here, but we must know is again with regard to patenting, you know, how do you protect your varieties? We have got a protection of pan variety and farmers right act. So all that is, is different ball game altogether, nationally, internationally, which is very important. And there's kind of negotiations are going on, you know, internationally when these convention on biological diversity meeting takes place among those 919 odd countries. But as scientists, we come back, our, our aim is to, of course, improve the crop plants by using, I said before, various advances in science technology. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of genetic engineering and, of course, a little bit more on, on genome editing. So way back in 2011, we put up this paper together, you know, to show that how important even agricultural biotechnology or for that matter, these different approaches are for developing superior and stress tolerant cultivars for climate resilience for a variable climate, which is changing so fast. And here the idea was again that time that you can take already known, popularly known tolerant crops or susceptible crops as a material. But then I said, no, we have got large number of these pandemic resources in different crops and also crop wide relatives. We almost forgotten about it, but the whole world has now come back and starting to talk about it more. And I'll give you some examples of this. How can we utilize today the crop wide for crop improvement by using these different approaches? In 2011, we did not know about genome editing, but that time, these were the approaches I said before, molecular breeding, genetic engineering, but that time we gave a concept that we must have integrated breeding. Single technology may not be enough. We must try to combine wherever required, depending upon which crop and which trait we're talking about it. So friends, genetic engineering has given us dividends already world over in India with BT cotton, many other crops, of course, in the pipeline, we had a national project on transgenics in crops, you know, where we developed about 12 crops. I'm not giving a list of those and it would have been a different lecture altogether again, you know, for various resistance to biotech and abiotic stresses and those crops have been developed and are in the regulatory pipeline from the ICR system. But then currently we are all excited globally to go beyond genetic engineering and GM crops to support our sustainable food production and also you know, becoming more strong socioeconomically, okay? And that is, I'm referring to genome editing. Certainly genome editing has come in a big way. I'm sure you all know this particular technology was, you know, recognized for the Nobel Prize in last year, October 2020, to two of the lady scientists of the world. And here, what this technology allows you is to alter the sequences of DNA in situ, right inside the cell, various mechanisms. I'll just describe it to you little bit about that. Then it allows us to go for targeted mutagenesis. I'm sure plant breeding students or otherwise people will know, those who are in agriculture, you know that at one time we were using radiation mutagenesis or chemical mutagenesis, which was at random. Several thousands of varieties have been developed globally, which are in the market available today, you know, but that those were like walking in a blind street. An idea was of what through radiation mutagenesis or through chemical mutagenesis, the idea was to create any kind of changes or alterations in the sequence of the DNA and then look for, select for the better ones. 
you know, out of thousands again you will select. But here this targeted mutagenesis allows you to do the same thing. You can alter the sequence DNA in situ, but in a very targeted fashion. You want to knock out a gene, or you want to create a point mutation, dimorphism, or you can do gene insertion or, or no, trait landing pads, you know, on, on a targeted location on a genome you can do a gene insertion, which of course we've been doing through genetic engineering, but these gene insertion through genetic engineering were always at random because there was no method to control where it's going to land, you know, on, on location in the chromosome. So here this allows you in a very targeted fashion, these alterations and ideally leaves no transgene footprint at all. Therefore, it's certainly a step beyond, you know, genetic engineering GM crux. Just to explain you briefly, this targeted genome in editing actually starts with a double standard break, which is done by a Cas nucleus, which was identified, which was a discovery by these two scientists. You know, of course, there were many other scientists, but these two lady scientists got a Nobel Prize, could find a value into it, and they could develop that into a technology that this can create a double stand here in a DNA, you know, and this DNA in a particular cell then has the tendency, you know, to repair itself. Okay, and that mechanism through which it repairs itself is non-homologous and joining. And when it repairs itself, certain bases will be deleted or certain new bases will be added. So we call them as, you know, gene disruption or it creates indels, indels, insertions or deletions of variable lengths. It could be five to 10 to 20, you know, nucleotide changes here. So if this gene is functional for that matter, you know, while repairing itself, it becomes non-functional because it cannot restore, you know, the same, you know, basis what it had beginning. So if you want to create a loss of function, you can do it this way, okay? And that we call it as delete. Basically in terms of editing, this is deletion, you know, as we delete a part of a sentence. Or as we call it as side directed nucleus one. Second is that I want to edit. Actually speaking, this is edit. Wherein there are certain sequences here in the, in the chromosome which I want to replace with as shown in the green here can be done. And finally, you can see here, the gene is corrected by the replacement of certain bases here, but that happens not automatically as it was happening here. You don't have to provide any kind of a template here. It automatically happens because of the presence of a cell machinery in the plant. Here you require a homology directed repair. This template you have to provide, you know, homology directed repair, we call it. This has an homology, you know, these flanking sequences, homology with the existing sequences. So they physically recombine. And when in the process, this will get inserted or, or I mean, in a way that the, the, you know, the genes or the bases here will get edited. So this is really speaking, we call it gene correction or real, in real sense, edit. And the third is again, you provide a longer template here instead of only few bases, for example, here, this is the whole full length gene you can provide. Okay, like we do in case of genetic engineering for developing GM crops, and then you can insert the whole gene here, you know, and, and you, that is true SDN3, and this is transgene insertion. So you'll ask me, what is the difference it has, you know, compared to genetic engineering, wherein also you put a transgene, whole gene into, into a genome, but here, as I said before, the advantage is that you can target it. You know, there we were having no control on its target of the transgene onto the location. So here it is targeted. So I'll be, so this could be utilized now, but this can be only utilized once you have searched those genes, I said before, from the germplasm, and you know which gene is associated with it, which particular phenotype, and how can you now therefore use, you know, this targeted genome editing for improvement of crop plants. And important friends is also here to know when we talk of regulation of this technology, like GM crops are all regulated. Questions are now world over people talking about it, whether this should also be regulated like as good as GM crops. My message is no, particularly for SDN1 and SDN2, they do not result in any novel combination of genetic elements, you know, and, and therefore they need to be kept as non-regulated material. So phases of developing these genome edited crops, once you have a gene identified against that gene, then you, you want to target it. You develop this single guide RNA. You, these are the CRISPR reagents, we call them. You know, then of course, Cas914 is required, which is a, which will create the double stranded break in the DNA. And finally, these two together are, are made in the form of a gene construct as shown here. 
you know, this is the sgRNA sequence, and this is the Cas914, and together they make a complex like this. And finally, of course, you then allow these reagents or this, this gene construct is bombarded or through agrobacteria-mediated transformation, like we do in case of transgenic crop development, you know, and this is then um, inserted into the, into the cells. And then you, from the cell, you, you know, you generate a whole plant, we call it as now genome-edited plant, Okay, and then you analyze at the molecular level that certain changes which you wanted to bring in that particular gene sequence, whether it has occurred or not, by genome sequencing, which is very cheap nowadays, and you can sequence, you know, 10, 20, 50 lines, and you can then, I'll give you some examples, and then you finally have these genome edited crops with improved traits. So now the traits, when you talk of the lecture given to me, is on climate resilience. So in fact, I was invited some time ago in last year you know, that how genome editing can help in, in climate resilience. So, I, resilience. for example, tolerance to drought, heat, soil, and salinity, you know, soil salinity, which is, of course, being done through conventional breeding or even through genetic engineering, but we must continue doing it because it's a complex trait and we need to go there still. We have not reached there. Enhanced flooding tolerance, improved nutrient acquisition and use efficiency, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, increased radiation use efficiency and photosynthesis improved pest and pathogen resistance, they are emerging pests. And then finally, of course, this is another dream or something to make impossible possible, whether symbiotic nitrogen fixation possible in cereals, oil seeds, millets, other than legumes. So that can also create a very good advantage and whether genome editing can be really useful to, to that impact or not. So to give a lot of resistance to diseases, for example, you know, this is gene editing, for resistance to plant pathogens. There are certain susceptibility genes known, you know, for, for as a source of resistance. And actually plant genes are hijacked by pathogens, you know, for, for their survival and growth. Basically, they are susceptible genes, let us say, in the plant system. And these susceptibility genes are targeted by these plant pathogens. Therefore, these plant pathogens make the plant susceptible. Now, the question is whether through genome editing, can we knock out this gene so that pathogen will not be able to survive when the gene is knocked out? And can we have knocking out this gene or function of this gene make the plant resistant? And that's what has been done. I'll give an example, just to illustrate here diagrammatically, that if these are the genes, this is a susceptible gene, you knock it out and this plant become resistant. And as you can see here in case of tomato, you know, there is one locus, we call it as mildew resistant locus, which is conserved throughout monocots and dicots, and it confers susceptibility to this fungi, you know, causing powdery mildew disease. Powdery mildew disease. Now, if suppose we know through genome editing, first of all, we know this gene. So this is the searching that gene. Somebody has searched this gene, a locus, which has got other genes as well. And in this gene, in this locus, if you create a mutation through genome editing, as you have shown here, 40 bases approximately have been deleted, you know, using uh, this genome editing technology. Okay, 48 base pairs have been deleted finally in the double stranded gene. Okay, and, and so now with the loss of function of this particular gene as shown here, we call it as mildew resistant locus, which is otherwise causing susceptibility. Now, with the loss of this function, will it provide resistance? So this is the wild type where you've got this merited plant. You can see here, this is totally resistant to, to powdery mildew. Another important example is disease resistance through genome editing in rice. So when I was talking to you about those susceptibility genes, you know, which are hijacked by these pathogens, just have a look at this particular panel here of this particular slide. So this, this is a gene in a plant. Let's say gene, whatever gene we call it, okay? But it encodes for a sugar transporter, glucose transporter. You know, that glucose transporter is made and that's lo it's located here on the, on, on the, you know, you can see plant cell membrane, okay? And this is a glucose transporter. So now, if there's an infection by a particular Genthomonas ozaia in this case, and will thrive and survive on this glucose. Okay, the, this gene is already making this gene, but this is in an uninfected plant cell, uninfected plant. It's making only, let's say, one glucose transporter. 
okay, because it has this gene. Now, what this bacteria will do, this bacteria will come and hijack this plant machinery by, by making some of its own proteins, they call it effector proteins, you know, and it will enhance the expression of the gene and will make more of sucr sucrose for itself or, or high glucose concentration will be there. And this, you know, bacteria can then thrive better. So now scientists have discovered, first of all, there's a plant gene. They've also discovered this bacteria has a gene which encodes for tail. They call it as transcription activator like effector protein. And, and this protein binds to the promoter sequence here of this particular gene. Then only it can make more and more glucose transporters. And it can then secrete more and more glucose from the cytosol you know, to, to the cell membrane so the bacteria can easily thrive it will suck away all that, you know, kind of uh, sugar uh, from, from wherever, you know, it is, it is infecting. I hope you got it. But so example, and now what can happen? Now, suppose through genome editing, once I know this is the gene, I can edit the sequence here in the promoter to which this effector is binding. So then the effector will not be able to bind and it will, plant will become resistant. And that's what exactly scientists have done. You know, this is a broad spectrum resistance to bacterial blight and rice using genome editing. This is the susceptible line, original line. Okay, these are three genome edited lines you can see here, and these are totally registered. So what they've done is they have changed the promoter sequence. They have actually mutated, edited, I would say, you know, mutated or edited the promoter sequences here in a manner, you know, that this particular protein is no more able to bind. So let even bacteria come, make its own protein, but it's not going to bind here and it will remain only in this situation as it is in case of an infected cell. So therefore, friends, these plants, it's shown become totally resistant. And this paper was published in, I think, Nature. Coming to resistance to abiotic expresses, ABA plays a very important role in ABA, abiotic expresses. Actually, it induces closure of stomata and conserves water loss, et cetera, et cetera. And that we have been actually, you know, reading and teaching as students and faculty members to our students. So, but then ABA receptors were discovered, which is important to recognize this expression, the action of ABA, you know, only in 2009. And that was found as one of the science breakthroughs of 20, 2009. And fortunately, without knowing this breakthrough, I must tell you, you know, of course we knew that this has happened, but we were searching for some new genes ourselves from some of the land races, another jump plasma, I'm talking about it, of course, rice, Nagina 22, rice land race Nagina 22, which is highly tolerant to drought. We know it. So from this land race, our idea was to find out the gene which makes it so tolerant. So we identified one gene, this number is given here, which we then, you know, registered uh, or sent for registration, you know, and it happened in 2009 by a student of mine. And we could see this in a model plant that we only saw it against cold that time. Yes, it's able to provide tolerance to cold compared to the wild type when you, you know, uh, and these are the control plants, but this is the cold treatment, given treatment plant. This is the wild type, these are transgenics with this particular ABA receptor gene, which we named is that, you know, that time or is as type of PIL3, but now it has been renamed as PIL10. And later Dr. Vishnuathan identified, you know, found that this is able to provide tolerance to both cold and drought. But there's another scientist, Jiakang Zhu, who is a wonderful, I would say the best expert in this area of abiotic tolerance, he increased not only grout tolerance to stress, but also rice growth and yield both together by editing ABA receptors. I said important earlier, I mentioned about is combining not only, I mean, combining high yield with, with stress tolerance. So this is exactly been done by the scientist by genome editing these ABA receptors. Actually, there are about 12 to 13 ABA receptors in case of rice, and he edited all of them. And then he found and studied the phenotype of those genome edited plants. So when he edited six of them, you know, the plant is behaving better than the wild type under stress conditions in pots. Or when he edits three of them, you know, then he only he finds even better than the one he edited six. I mean, there is a different mechanism must be, you know, taking place in it that, of course, you know, I have not talked much about it here. But then idea is when he took these plants, you know, particularly these plants to the field, he found that these plants had even higher yield, much higher yield. This is that plant compared to 1500 gram per plot. This has got about 2000. 
Of course, economically speaking, it is per plot. Plot would be not too big, as you can see from, from the size of the yield. But nevertheless, this has shown its expression and is taking this work forward by genome editing the AB receptors. Not only that you make plant more stress adapted, but also it gives you better rice growth and yield, as you can see here combined. And this is what is a best trait when you talk of climate resilience. We have got, of course, several of plants which are climate resilient, but what we want always higher yield and higher biomass. So but another now, the last leg of my presentation, I'm talking about it again, continuing with, with germplasm or genetic resources. One of the categories is wild species. Okay, and they have got a big role in modern variety development already, actually speaking, you know, when we started agriculture 10,000 years ago. See, the, these are the wild species with so many genes as shown here in different colored squares. So early domestication, when our forefathers, farmers, when they started it, when there was no agriculture, as we have it today, you know, they were select from there, here, the best ones, and they will select continue for generations, but in the, because, and they were looking only which is good yielding traits or good tasting traits, et cetera, et cetera, you know? And, but in the process, you know, some of the genes left, were left behind, as you can see the, you know, the green ones, or sorry, the, the, the yellow ones here, they're not here, they're left behind. You know, this, this is, we call it to the process of early domestication. And then in the development of modern varieties through, through plant breeding, again, you can see here that these genes have been further narrowed down. The base has been narrowed down. The red genes that shown here are, are, are not there in our modern plant varieties. So, and, and these are the genes, by the way, shown in, in yellow or red, which provides resistance to various diseases or even good for even nutrition. So the idea is, can we try to now bring back the genes through genome editing into these modern cultivars or not? First of all, important is again, we must collate all those information on such wild relatives of cultivated plants in India. We have done it in 2014. So this is a ready-made information available to you all that which particular wild species or its relative for a particular crop is good for which particular trait we're talking about it, climate resilience or nutrition or resistance to abiotic stresses or biotic stresses or or or, or etc. Okay. And I'm just showing you this example. You know, you must be wondering what it is. This example, you know, is quite an important example. This is a wild species of tomato, which is not red. This is a modern high yielding cultivar. You can see from the size is so different. Okay. And then these two varieties were crossed to have some genes from here, you know, for resistance or whatsoever for various traits. Surprisingly, they found the resultant of these two, this is the product, which is much more red in color, lycopene. This is for the high quality, carotenoids, antioxidant, the best available in the world, you know, dietary point of view, okay? So this, you know, it means had genes even for redness, which it doesn't turn red itself or the size is too small. So there are genes for both increased size as well as in intense color. And this is because of lycopene content. So in short, what I'm trying to tell you is that these crop wild relatives, so wild species, represent a largely untapped opportunity for breeders to improve the climate resilience and nutrition. Now the question is, number one, that these modern varieties, we insert genes from here through genome editing or through gen genetic engineering, or can we try to do genome editing right here? These plants are highly resistant to various diseases and to, you know, or to various stresses like abiotic and biotic stresses, okay? Uh, but then they're not high yielding. So can we try to, and they're not high yielding for various reasons, as you can see here, you know, the plant type is not a good plant type. The fruit size is very small. So can we try to suppose do genome editing in this white species itself so that these tomatoes turn red and you know like this and these tomatoes become big and also they already have an advantage of resistance to, to various biotic and abiotic stresses. It already has those genes which we lost here in our modern cultivar. You know, therefore we need to irrigate them all the time. We need to protect them from press and you know indiscriminately spread, you know, spray all the pesticides. So this is a new concept. And this is one actually being done through, you know, or earlier without genome editing, pre bidding is one of the ways to bridge this, you know, bit gap between the, you know, genetic resources and crop improvement. You know, pre bidding in the sense that you cannot directly cross these two. 
their problems, linkage drag, even sexual incompatibility, the F1 hybrid will not survive, will not be fertile. So, you know, they will, there are certain rescue operations actually carried out. And this is pre-breeding, I don't want to go into details of it. It takes about 10 years. Then only you go for the crop improvement, which takes another 10 years. But now, fortunately, you know, through genomics of these crop relatives, you know, there's a possibility of expanding the gene pool for crop improvement. We can identify genes on one hand, I said before, which can be inserted into the modern cultivars. On the other hand, what is also important is that can we have accelerated domestication of these wild species directly by themselves? For example, this is wild tomato. Wild tomato, as you can see, will have lesser fruits, more of leaves, okay? And that's what our forefathers would have selected, you know, for more and more fruits and lesser leaves, et cetera, over the time. But this is the plant which is otherwise resilient to climate or has got high nutrition. But now through genome editing, it has been shown very clearly that if you edit some of the genes shown here through this complex Cas9, CRISPR Cas9 complex system, if you see these four genes, you know, through multiplex editing, it's not multiplex because you've got one, two, three, four, or five genes. Together, if you're editing in this wild species of tomato, you can make it cultivated type. You know, otherwise it has taken thousands of years, okay, to convert from the wild as we have in domesticated tomato, or through conventional breeding, it will take 20 to 30 to 40 years. The examples in case of rice to take that much long time. But through genome editing tools, this wild tomato can be converted into domesticated or kind of high yielding, as you can see, more tomatoes, less leaves, just in two to three years. And this has been done. This is an example of, of the, you know, of this wild species, you know, Solinum pimpenifolium, which is a wild tomato, converted through genome editing of so many different traits and genes to de novo, they call it altogether new process of domesticating tomato, which has got, you can see, more fruits and lesser leaves. You know, you can go by layer by layer. Here there are 12 to 17 genes. Here there are totally about seven to 12. Of course you need leaves. Here you got upper three and three and three. Here you got just in one leaf and no leaf at all and more tomatoes. And these are the different genes. I don't want to go into details of it, but the genes responsible for compact plant architecture, synchronized food ripening, day length insensitivity, and enlarged fruit size or increased vitamin C level from nutritional point of view. But then remember, the genes were identified by someone, you know, their functional genomics was done properly. Then only these genes, one could easily do it in case of tomato, as mentioned here, these five genes actually speaking. And by this, the advantage is when you convert these properties into crops like this, which are domesticated, but you also retain many of the valuable resilience and nutritional traits which were left behind during domestication and, and breeding. So this is that powerful science and technology, which our honorable prime minister must have thought of even using that time, of course, for nuclear science, but even for agricultural science, you know, for improving productivity and profitability of our farmers. So finally, friends, the take home messages for mostly students and faculty members are this. Develop basic understanding on plant and nutrient sources including all types, land races, wild species, et cetera, and, and value their hidden potential. Search for it, for search for those genes. Then gain sufficient knowledge about genes and related traits. Searching genes which are related to particular traits. Then develop efficient gene transformation system and elite crop genotypes. This I have been talking about it from the days of my NRCPB when I used to organize these training courses under NATP and otherwise where more than 500 scientists were trained, et cetera, who are now occupying key positions and all. So we must still continue developing efficient gene transformation. It's important in not only in elite crop plant genotypes, but also in wild species. I give you an example of, of tomato. Unless you have this transformation system available in wild tomato, for example, or wild rice, you cannot transform because these are, they are different approaches when you talk of transformation of elite crop genotypes or wild species. Finally, this all can be only done when university like RLB's Central Agriculture University under the leadership of Professor Arvind Kumar, Dr. Anil Kumar and others can undertake training and capacity building. Until unless we do this, we cannot make progress. And I think I give this more emphasis while talking here, you know, in this university, Rani, Rani Lakshmi Bhai Jhansi 
you know, um, Central University of Agriculture, that this is up, upcoming so well already from the infrastructure, you know, but now I think the training capacity building of their scientists and students is very important for searching genes and then taking them for genome editing. There's no other route, friends, remember this. You have to associate with conventional plant breeding, of course, which will always remain important, but this is the only way to move forward. And increase the efficiency of true genome editing, I can talk about it later. And of course, training in bioinformatics, computational biology is also very, very important. And of course, I said before, these technologies, unfortunately, the products developed out of these technologies are regulated. So I would like to give a message for our government, and that is, can we please make the GM crops and genome editing crops the integral component of our self-reliant India? It is very important. Today, fortunately, we have been able to cross the 300 million tons of mark, but then again, you know, climate change, radiation, how much water, how much fertilizers, how much indiscriminate use of, you know, pesticides going through. You know, it's important, therefore, these advances, as was envisaged that time by our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Atulvari Bajpayee to add this Jain Vigyan, and even now our Honorable Prime Minister Modi ji adding, you know, Jain Anusandhan, it's important, you know, that these science technologies to take forward into development of our own country and for the sustainability and profitability of our small rural farmers for doubling their incomes. It's important. And in fact, realizing the importance of all these National Academy of Agricultural Sciences of which Professor Arvind Kumar himself happens to be our honored and esteemed fellow, you know, he and also the member of the Agriculture Council, he in fact must have participated in it. We had a discussion at the national level and came up with this regulatory framework for genome edited crops to give a mention uh, or a, and a message to the government again that please keep them unregulated at least of SDN1 and SDN2 kind where there's no novel genetic recombination of, of DNA taking place. So finally, this is my own message actually speaking, you know, through my experience of working in this in technologies and jump plasm. The jump plasm to genome engineering is the new route now. To sustain for sustainable grain evolution. I want to attach only genome engineering or only germ plasm will not be able to take us there. It's germ plasm to genome engineering together. Important, that's a new route for sustainable grain evolution. And also it's a time to combine conventional pan beading, not to be forgotten, with precision phenotyping, genomics, and genome-based editing tools for heralding a new sustainable food production system new sustainable food production system, keeping in view United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We cannot harm the environment anymore. We cannot indiscriminately use the fertilizers, the chemicals. You know, there is a potential. We have all those technologies now available, fortunately. And, and this technology is going to stay. You know, fortunately, this was invited article came onto the cover of this agro spectrum, where I give a message that this technology is here to stay and India must take as much benefit as possible for, for for our growth. And with regard to capacity building, I tell you, you know, uh, I'm quite interested in organizing this, though I'm not directly working on a bench myself, but I've got young scientists whom I would like to take forward, you know, and teach them. Uh, and we organize a hands-on workshop. Actually, we got a break just before the second wave of COVID-19 in March. We organized it with about 14 participants, you know, and, and uh, with one, some of the very best international, those names are here, and the national speakers, including Devo Jyoti Chakarbarthi, who's working on mammalian cell genome editing. He's the best in the world, actually, from India. We're so proud of him. He's a very young scientist in CSIR, IGIB. You know, and some of the students even from Delhi University participated in it. And the next one we are organizing, by the way, Delhi University itself on their demand, you know, which is from September 27 to October 1, 2021. This is going to be online, actually. You know, but this was offline when we had both lectures and, and of course online lectures from our, you know, online from our foreign experts. So with this, I acknowledge, of course, all my students and um, my funding agencies and institutions and friends and collaborators. Dr. Prabhu, Dr. A.K. Singh, Dr. Yadav, Dr. Vishnathan, and large number of partners with whom I worked when I was coordinator of this National Project Transgenics and Crops. And of course, the NBPGR scientist, you know, which was the institution which gave me so much of strength to make that impossible possible when we talked of characterization evaluation of entire gem plasma, not only of wheat, but also of chickpea, and which has been recognized internationally. I'm very happy about it. So with this, friends, I, I thank you all. And, uh, and I'm sure uh, you will take a
least one message out of it and, and young students, faculty members in an institution like Central Agriculture University in Jhansi, you know, I'm sure you will really take a lead and, and collaborate with the best of the best international national institutions, you know, where I'll be happy to, to in fact, you know, to help you out uh, to make these collaborations happen and, and deliver products. So with this, friends, thank you very much. And once again, thank Professor Dr. Arvind Kumarji, you know, for this rare opportunity and also my good old friend, Dr. Anil Kumar, whom I used to, you know, really enjoy talking to him when he was at Pantnagar. He, is, he himself is a very good basic scientist and an intelligent researcher and a very good teacher. Uh, and uh, so I'm very happy that I got this platform. And finally, of course, I pay my homage and tribute to a great legendary person, our own honorable late Prime Minister Sri Atul Bihari Bajpayee, and even including our present Prime Minister Sri Modi ji for recognizing the value of science. So therefore, Jay Vigyan, Jay Nusandhan, and Namaskar to all of you and wish you and best wishes for tomorrow's Independence Day, completing 74 years, entering into the 75th year of independence. And, and I hope India will take lead in science and will become global leader in, in agricultural food production, you know, with, with minimal resources as we're doing it right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, all the listeners, all the audience. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you so much, sir, for a very delightful presentation. Sir, you have provided many much information about the genes uh, that you have shared. You have talked about the gene genome editing, editing uh, the importance of it, targeted genome editing and the disease resistance and the need of training. The need of this hour that we should go for training for bioinformatics and computational biology. So, and so we'll keep it in our mind and uh, we should try to collaborate and uh, try to uh, focus on these things. And your last word, germplasm to genome engineering. And nowadays we should be focusing the, on these that this is a new route for sustainable uh, green revolution. So uh, we all should be focusing on these now. So thank you so much, sir, uh, about today's presentation that you've given, sir. It was a very interesting one. So now uh, I... Uh, if any comments, uh, if anyone wish to give a regarding the presentation, or should I continue the program? Uh, Director of Education, sir. Anybody who wish to have any queries and questions, uh, Dr. Bansal will be delighted to answer. And you, the lecture was so clear and crisp. You know, there, there is going to be no scope for anyone. It's all clear. Wonderful. You know, but I would like to still have interaction and see whether there is. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's, yeah. right. that's right. Hello. Uh, good evening, sir. Yeah. Good evening. I, uh, sir, this is Dr. Abhishek Kumar from Rani Lakshmi Vai Center Agriculture University. So, being I, I am here teaching associate in the Department of Biotechnology, sir. So I have a couple of queries. It is not, uh, I would say here, not it is a query, but I would like to learn from you, sir. So the first, uh, my query about uh, that, as you have mentioned that even India has generated so many genetic crops, but still the commercial cultivation in India it still is, uh, I would say here, uh, as compared to other countries, very less. I couldn't get your point. What are you trying to say? Uh, so, means what, uh, what could be the reason, sir? Still, uh, we are in lagging to uh, commercial cultivation of genetic uh, improved crops. We, we are not lagging. In fact, we are not getting official approvals. So, you know, we, uh, you know, no, we, we see every government have their own socio-economic kind of considerations, and they have to be answerable to the public at large. And of course, scientists themselves feel the regulation is important, but only our appeal is to the government is that the process should be science-based and it should move smoothly forward, you know, to whatever the regulation we, we want to have it. So it's not that we are lagging behind. We have got 20 different crops from public and private sector for various crops which are genetically modified. You know the examples of BD Brinjal, you know already the example of mustard hybrid developed by, by Dr. Zipa Santal. You know, it's group in Delhi University and many more we developed, as I said before, in NRCPB, 
you know, through this national network on transgenics and crops. You know, many crops are there, in fact, in India, you know, already. So only question is that we have to go through this regulatory process. The regulatory process, unfortunately, is, is taking time and uh, perception of the public need to change. And we as scientists must play an important role in communicating, you know, um, the, the science-based kind of facts, you know, not being, you know, emotional at times, which many of us at times become, because important is that science is the one which can take us forward. And, and uh, I hope uh, someday the message will be clear. That's what we keep appealing. And therefore, we're also talking about through these limited crops, you develop these guidelines, you know, uh, and, um, and help the Department of Biotechnology, you know, that not to regulate at least the two different kinds I mentioned about the genomic crops. So the research is going on. The students are taking interest. And I would say that they must continue working uh, because this is the way forward, you know, globally speaking. And um, yeah, a lot to do. I see also uh, Dr. Chaturvedi, thank you. Yeah. Chaturvedi, you are present. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. sir, sir. You been, it was really ex ex excellent lecture, sir, as usual. Because <laughs> uh, 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 really, it was a very informative and uh, excellent one. Congratulations for that, sir. Uh, just, sir, uh, my concern is with the implementation of many rules, regulations through these regulatory bodies. The flow of genetic material, it is being really restricted even within the country. So what can be done for the yes. free flow? Uh, because NDPGR is a nodal agency and uh, you were at the helm of affairs. And at that point of time, we were right. not facing so many difficulties. But now, as soon as the uh, days are passing, uh, many problems are uh, or hurdles are coming in on the way in sharing the material. How to deal it with the uh, you know, right. I, I, I it hampering the crop improvement program no, in general in this country, sir? No, Dr. Duvedi, you are very right. And I know you, being a plant breeder, would have that pinch actually feel about it. And uh, I know the material should always, you know, flowing freely as it was, you know. But the only thing is now, since we are signatory and there are these internationally binding, you know, legally binding instruments we have signed, so it's our national responsibility also to really speaking follow those rules and regulations. But nevertheless, you know, only thing is, as we have been also talking over time with, with the chairperson of the National Biodiversity Authority in Chennai, present and, and the, in the past ones, and we have requested them to have an efficient process of clearance. Even if there, there is a regulation or an application required for various kind of permission to use this material, but the time. But now I believe the system has changed and they are quite efficient. And but at the same time, you know, for for public labs and public systems, you at times you have to only give information. You don't have to, in fact, also wait for the permission to come. So and and all these restrictions are because we have to follow these international guidelines and we have to also preserve our material within our own jurisdiction in India so that it doesn't get pilfered to another country outside, you know, without official routes. Official routes are there, you know, of course, for them as well, even for the foreign nationals or for foreign companies. And we try to actually speaking honor our own law, but at the same time, Dr. Chaturvedi, I must tell you, Dr. Mahapatra himself took an initiative in a big way with the Department of Biotechnology Secretary and all of them to revise actually some of the clause and sections of these, you know, Biodiversity Act, where I was a partner myself to attend that meeting. And I hope we have suggested some of those very processes which are particularly plant breeding, that they should be treated like, like you know, where the Nakim, you know, as they use the because they're exempted. So the plant breeders who are working for public good, Dr. Ashok from Director IRI made this point very clearly, you know, that we are also working for public good for increasing production, you know, for and the profitability of the smallholder farmers. So it's important that we are also kept out and exempted. So we have accepted that actually, you know, and, and it, it's gone to the government, I hope. Things will revise and become much better. Because, sir, major major concern is uh, now that uh, the sharing within the NRES, sharing of the material, we should allow free flow of the material yeah. within uh, national agriculture research and education system. And that is not happening. That is also right. happening now. So that has that should happen. And no, actually, uh, I, I am sure that uh, I agree with you. person like you, if uh, deliver lecture on benefit sharing and the sharing of the material. I think sure. that will uh, provide a good sure. uh, roadmap to the country as well. So, 
No, I think, no, you, you're right. This should be rather my responsibility since I worked in that area and being at NPPGR and, um, and, and I have to interact more with the current chairman or chairperson of the NBA. And I agree with you and maybe I will take help of a few of the leaders like you and uh, Dr. Ashok Singh, the director of IRI and uh, others uh, to really make a strong case that where we are at the moment and identify the issues and we can even have a small discussion, you know, kind of in a consultation with a few people, those who matter. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sure. Excellent. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. It was really, again, nice meeting you and talking to you as well today online. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the, uh, uh, all the interactions and you have interacted, sir, with so much interest, sir. Thank you for that. So now moving forward to program. Now I would like to request the chief patron, patron of the event, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, of all university, Professor Arvind Kumar, sir, for giving his remarks on today's lecture under the series and apprises from your experience and knowledge. Good afternoon to each and everyone participating in this very important and uh, I would say enlightening lecture by Professor Vamsal. And I'm happy to see again the large number of people who attended uh, the lecture till end. In fact, uh, many people, they leave but uh, this is the lecture where I could see almost 75% of the participants, they are still uh, very much on the screen. So that's a wonderful situation. Let me first uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Casey Bansal for giving a very thought provoking and very, I would say knowledgeable talk, which uh, is certainly very much useful, not for the faculty member, but for the students and also for the policy planners, because there are many issues which has been raised by him, which are, you know, to be taken by the policy planner. I know Dr. Bansal has been a, a, you know, very active person and I knew him for the last two decades since uh, he was the coordinator of that master transgenic program and uh, I was at the time director of National Research Center, the then National Research Center on Rape Kid and Mustard at Bharatpur. So I had a lot of interaction with him and I have seen him always taking a lot of interest in the developmental activities and the initiative at large taken being as a national NAS fellow or now as a secretary or even otherwise as a director of NBPGR. I know many times we used to talk how we can take carry forward, how we can, uh, you know, uh, give the message to the government that uh, these uh, GM crops could certainly benefit our farmers by, you know, having their income much more than the uh, usual one. And there is a need. In fact, worldwide, uh, you know, the GM crops are in place. And even in India, what to talk about, I used to talk why, why we are importing the soya oil. In fact, many products we are importing. And, uh, you know, even the brinjal, which we talk about, even it is under cultivation. So the question is that many things we are already consuming and it is not harming, but it is, you know, as Dr. Bansal has rightly pointed out, it is the, you know, in larger interest of the public, the government has to see and ultimately take a uh, decision in this regard. But I'm sure that the government is positive in doubling the income of the farming community. And uh, this particular aspect would certainly help in developing the farmer's income. Uh, in fact, uh, I am very happy that many aspects have been touched in a very simpler manner and uh, gives a message, directly gives a message. Uh, he has got a you know very good publication in uh, top ranking journals. I know he got many awards, and uh, he has been always uh, been a key supporter of science. And uh, particularly, I was very much impressed when I could see the germ plan, all germ plan which was in the field in Hisar. I, I happened to visit uh, that uh, university 
and uh, I specifically devoted half day, and I was so impressed that lot of variability we could see over there, and this was for us for the first time that uh, the material went out of the you know racks of the uh, you know NBPDR. Otherwise, it is to be very limited, and this was a unique experiment. Of course, some risk was there, but that risk was taken by Dr. Bansal, and that really paid a lot of dividends, not only to the scientists, but everyone. And this used to be celebrated like a function. Everybody went over there, dignitaries went over there, they could see the diversity. Otherwise, people could not have seen the diversity. Even Grasika, he did the same thing. And probably, if he would have been for a longer period of time, he could have taken <laughs> certainly the action for the other crops also. So this is the way, unless you do something innovative, you take the risk, you cannot uh, make any development in science. So that's, you know, I really compliment uh, the efforts made by Dr. Bansal in this regard, which has made a tremendous revolution in, I would say, wheat trading. And that is, you know, now we, we are seeing the results of it. Now you can see that we are celebrating that uh, the fourth estimate said that we had already 3.8 uh, uh, million tons of the food grain production. And we all time high production of 109.106 uh, 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 or 109.52. So this means that all time record production of eight crops, never it has happened in the history. Talk about rice, talk about wheat, talk about maize, pulses 25.72, highest uh, ever production, oil seeds, never we have achieved 36.1 million tons of production. In case of mustard, never we have achieved, you know, more than 8.5 or so. This time we have achieved 10.1 million tons. Groundnut record production of 10.2 million tons. What I mean to say that this is because of our general resources. This is because the wonderful work has been done, as he has told the, you know, cycle, gene to genomes to the general Ultimately, if we utilize the evaluate utilization and you know proper uh, use in the research activities, certainly we can make a lot of uh, headway. And uh, I am sure that uh, the recent years, lot of uh, action has been taken. The germplasm access has become uh, much more easier than it was, you know, perhaps uh, before. And uh, what I can say that when, uh, soever I approach, when I joined as the vice chancellor of this university. I told my scientists, please go to NPG. Dr. Bansal is there. He will certainly help uh, you all. And he certainly helped. And a lot of, uh, you know, germ plant resources which were available, which were requested, were given to us and that are paying now dividends to us. So this is the way one has to take a decision. Otherwise, people are so sometimes become conservative. Sometimes the paper works. Sometimes they don't take any decision. And that is how the things are left behind. But I'm sure that with a uh, lot of initiative, the NVPGR has grown, which has been nourished uh, by none other than Dr. Padoda. And I know uh, when it was being inaugurated, I had the opportunity to be present in that function also. And I've seen how uh, it has been growing. And this is perhaps the wonderful center across the globe, which is not across the India, I would say, across the globe. Nowhere we have such a wonderful facility, wonderful mechanics, and also the gene bank, which is, you know, supporting the part of the uh, scientific community. So, uh, and now the students, you know, you know, India is a hottest part, but he has clearly shown that four really the hottest parts, which are, you know, uh, which have been exploited and further needs to be exploited. It is not that we have exploited 100% of our uh, land races. Like uh, Nagina Bais, he has given the example one of the land races. And uh, I remember when I was at Pantanagar, we used to talk a lot about Nagina uh, 22, which is a very old variety. But you know, the significant headway has been made utilized in this particular material. So like that, uh, the germ plant resources has a tremendous, uh, you know, uh, role to play as far as the developing of the climate resilient varieties, as well as, you know, to have a climate resilient when we take. I mean, it includes the disease resistance, it includes the drought resistance, it includes, you know, everything, even the flood resistance, even, you know, adverse climatic conditions like he has shown, 
So all the uh, aspects have been, uh, you know, are very important and he has so nicely covered. In fact, we would uh, love to have him here uh, on this, uh, I would say, uh, beautiful campus. Only one can see when one, one can one visit over here, then one can really appreciate. And I'm sure that at the earliest we will call him here and certainly the students would be much more benefited by uh, interaction, one-to-one uh, -one interaction with him and uh, the way he has shown the path, how best we can uh, carry forward our plant building activities, developmental activities by using the biotechnological approaches is really tremendous. So with these words, I thank uh, Dr. Bansal and uh, I'm, I'm very happy that he is still very active. Uh, normally, after the retirement, uh, you know, people think that I am retired, I have done enough, what to do, but uh, he is not satisfied. He is, uh, you know, always uh, for the gain of some new things. And uh, you can see even in 2020, the papers and good papers are being published. So that's, you know, that's what going to be a spirit of a scientist. Scientist, scientist, he, he can never retire. For the lifetime, he is a scientist. And the more and more he is experienced, he can, you know, mentor the others. He can give, you know, a lot of uh, message to the others. This is what is required. And that quality is for us, uh, Professor Bansal has. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful to Professor Anil Gupta, who has, uh, you know, uh, made a lot of contact with Professor Bansal. And when he came to me that, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I want that Dr. Bansal to uh, uh, address and uh, he should deliver uh, the... Uh, lecture in the Atal Jayavigyan lecture series. So I asked him that uh, please uh, ask him if he can find time because I know he is busy being not only as a secretary of now but also other engagements. But fortunately, he agreed for which the university is really grateful to him for uh, giving us a lot of uh, opportunity for our students, for our faculty to have an interaction, to learn a lot of things. And I'm sure that all must have benefited by his lecture. And I'm sure that in further interactions by meeting to him, we will certainly gain further. And I cannot forget the innovative actions he has taken. And I cannot forget the support which he has given to this university by providing the general plan resources, which is very valuable and which is making a tremendous headway. So thank you, Professor Bansal. Thank you very much. And we are really grateful to you for uh, you know giving My this pleasure. opportunity and in fact uh, I said, this online I salute you for creating this institution this yeah. temple of education I salute yeah you for initially this. you know initially we have some hurdles but until there is you know hurdles you cannot cross uh, the race so it is good that the hurdles are there so it gives you more pleasure when you you know succeed after crossing all those hurdles so fortunately with the blessings of you all we could develop this one of the institutions of national importance. And I may also like to add, you know, we have 16 advanced uh, laboratories exclusively for different, uh, you know, aspects. For example, the biotechnology lab, it's wonderful. And we have uh, recently ordered, many equipments are already there, worth about six crores of rupees. And that will, you know, give you, you know, whatsoever you have told that these are the things the students must learn and they must do it. So that, that thing would come up. So within three, four months time, you know, you would see that whatsoever deficiency is there, it would be all covered and uh, people will feel pleasure to come over here and to do uh, the, uh, you know, very crisp and uh, good research work, uh, which shall pay dividends to the farming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank Dr. you, thank you, thank thank you, you Dr. Gupta and all the team members for organizing this wonderful lecture. And keep it, uh, you know, organizing such wonderful lectures uh, very frequently because we want that uh, we are celebrating Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. And this is again very good that on the eve of the Independence Day, this very important lecture is being organized and the proceedings of this lecture may also be circulated far and wide so that people know about it and what are the messages, particularly in the last night which we have given, we can also place on the website so that people can read it and they can really uh, learn many things out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, Thank please you. share your uh, PDF version of your presentation sure. so that we are keeping in our library all the Atal Javiyan lecture series.
Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your uh, encouraging words and remarks on today's topic. As our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, has put out the desire to invite you here physically, uh, Dr. Kesi Bansal, sir, we also would like to be very happy to welcome you here in our beautiful campus in the future whenever we get the chance. So thank you, sir. I'm waiting for that opportunity to come and meet you all in physical terms. Yes, sir. We are also delighted. So uh, before we end the program, as today is the eve of Independence Day, India will be celebrating its 75th Independence Day on uh, 20, August 15, 2021, that is tomorrow, with the usual pride to mark its freedom from the British rule. So Independence Day is significant as it stands as a reminder of the sacrifice that many freedom fighters made to get independence from the British rule. So to honor this event, we all shall stand and sing our national anthem after the word of thanks that we'll be having the official uh, uh, today. So, so as a co-coordinator of Atalje Vigyan Lecture Series, I would like to give a formal word of thanks to uh, who is associated with today's event today. So first of all, I heartily congratulate our today's speaker, Dr. K.C. Bansalsa, for giving a fabulous presentation and um, now a very warm thank you, thank you to our Honorable Vice Chancellor sir, for all your supporting and guiding us to do uh, to go forward with this event. Director Extension uh, sir, uh, sorry, Director Education sir, Dr. Anil Kumar sir, for leading and guiding and inviting special guests from all over the uh, world. So we are extremely thankful to our Director Research sir, Dr. Dr. Ayar Sharma sir, Director Extension Education, Dr. S. S. Singh sir, Dean Agriculture, Dr. S. K. Chaturvedi sir, uh, Dean Horticulture and Forestry, Dr. A. K. Pandey sir, University Librarian, Dr. S. Akuswa sir, Head of the Departments, Faculties and Students of the uh, Rani Lakshmi Central Agriculture University. We are very much delighted to have you all sir, uh, all in this event. I would also like to thank all the participants who have taken out their precious time from their busy schedule at this in institute and attended from the other institutes other than uh, our uh, RLBCAU and made this program a successful one. So lastly, I would like to thank the organizing committee for the event, namely Dr. Gaurav Sharma, Dr. Suva Trivedi, Dr. Tanuj Mishra for successfully organizing this event. So thank you to you all. So now, uh, to conclude the program, as I have already uh, said now, uh, I am requesting Dr. Tanuj Mishra to please play the national anthem, and this will mark the conclusion of today's program. For that, all are requested to please uh, switch on the videos. Just um, play. Okay. Janagana mana adhina hayaka jaya hai Marata bhaagya vidhya kata Anjaan jasi hindu gujarat marata thala Ravira kushara vanta Vindya hima chala yamuna kamuna Uchara jagadhika dhuna Tava shubha shubha ne jage Thank you, thank you very much, sir, for your precious presence and uh, the citation we used to provide to our uh, learned speaker that will be sent by post and uh, otherwise I would like to invite not only on my personal behalf, but also on the behalf of the vice chancellor and right. all fellow colleagues of the university. Sure. So, but citation will uh, certainly send to your... Uh, yeah, post. you have my mailing address anyway, you can courier it to me, that will be great. Yes. Right. Thank, thank you, thank so you much. sir. Thank I'll you send so you my much. courier address. Yeah. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank bye. you, sir. Bye, bye, Doctor Yunmun. Sorry. Mm -hmm. you
Yumnam sir. Yumnam. <laughs> Yumnam. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yumnam. See you later. Thank you. All of you, Dr. Chaturvedi, Dr. Sharma, Dr. Tanuj, Dr. Shubha. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. I close now. Thank you, sir.